I have always had a saying, my whole adult life really is expectations leads to disappointments. So when you put yourself into this expected box, oh, I expect this place, country will be like this, and my life abroad will be this way, then you're really setting yourself up for disappointments. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't set intentions. You can always be intentional in the way you move. But try not to have so many expectations just to go for it, to be present in the moment because you cannot control the future. You don't know what happens and anything can shift where it can change the trajectory of your abroad career or you moving abroad. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Flourish in the Foreign the podcast that elevates and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving and just generally doing the damn thing and looking good doing it abroad. This podcast also explores living abroad as a pathway to wellness. Yes, what does that mean? By going abroad, you can, my guests have, I have, can really create a lifestyle and a life that works well for us. Sometimes a lifestyle in which we are born in or raised in is just not hidden. It's not hidden. And we can decide to go abroad and create a life that works better for us in a culture and a society that fits better for us. Yes, but peep that I did say cultivate. Yeah, like we are active participants in the cultivation of our lives, right? In in creating a life well lived for us. The life well lived does not come automatically because you move somewhere else, y'all. I know y'all know it, but y'all know there's some people that think that and that's not true. So that's what this here podcast is all about. I am the host, Christine Job. I am a black American woman living here in Barcelona. I'm also a business strategist that helps black women and women of color leverage their skills and their talents into viable and sustainable online businesses. Businesses that make them professionally fulfilled while also being financially abundant in whatever ways that that means to them so that they can pursue thriving lives abroad. Yes, that is what I also do. I also occasionally write business articles for theblackexpat.com. My latest article is up there now in which I discuss some of the considerations you should think about before starting a business abroad, whether that be in the online space or it be a brick and mortar business. I do share some insights that I think are pretty good. I think they're pretty on the money. Y'all check it out. Let me know what you think. You can find a link to that article in the link in the bios across all social media channels. You can find that or you can just pop over to theblackexpat.com and you can find it there and let me know what you think. All right. Shout out to the Black Expat. Appreciate you. This podcast is a labor of love, but y'all know it. It's labor. It is labor for real. And that is why I am asking you all to support this here podcast, this black woman podcast, so that I can hire somebody or at least get an intern or two to help with this this beautiful podcast that started off as like a little passion project and now has has a whole mind of its own. So Please support this here podcast. You can do so by becoming a patron. You can go to www.patreon.com slash flourish foreign. You can cash out the podcast at dollar sign flourish foreign. You can you can purchase production equipment for the podcast on the Amazon wish list for this podcast. You can find that at www.flourishintheforeign.com slash support. And of course, please make sure that you are sharing the podcast, not only with your friends and your family, but like on your LinkedIn with your professional network too. 
Also, please make sure that you have rated this podcast five stars. Yeah. And written a review because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I love to hear why you keep on coming back and pressing play. That means a lot to me. And it helps other people discover this podcast and give this podcast a chance. Y'all know we're kind of overwhelmed with content. There's so many other things that y'all could be doing besides listening to this podcast. So I appreciate you for listening to this podcast. But to get other people to listen to the podcast, we need the reviews to convince them. And we need not only the reviews you write, but also you sharing this podcast across your social networks, giving it your stamp of approval so that people will check out the podcast. So please do that. I have given y'all so many ways to support this Black Woman podcast. And I hope that you have decided to support a Black woman in any way that you can today. All right, on to the next episode. Today's episode features Marie, and I really enjoyed speaking with Marie. I think she has such a lovely spirit, and I think her insights of being a speech pathologist abroad really shines a light on not only some of the highs and lows that expats go through, but how in making these decisions, making sure that you are in alignment and that you have a clear vision for yourself is key. But I'm going to let her tell you all about it. My name is Marie Henderson, and I'm 42 years old. I am currently living in the Philippines, but due to COVID-19, I am in Atlanta, Georgia, taking shelter. I've always been an avid reader. Ever since I can remember, I've always read books. Books were my comfort place. So I would say maybe around the age of eight or nine, I started reading like choose your own adventure books. And a lot of times those books have places or they name places in the books. So that got me familiar with just other countries. And then I would just do my own little investigation, looking up things in an encyclopedia at that time. We didn't have internet at all. So I remember just reading about places like India was my first one. I really remember thinking, oh, India. And then I went to the book of encyclopedias to just look it up and just look at pictures and read about like country facts and things like that, population and things. I asked Marie to tell me about her university experience, where she attended, what did she study, and if she had the opportunity to study abroad. Yeah, no, my university experience was pretty blah, I would say. I went to a state school in downstate of Illinois. And I originally was supposed to go away to TSU in Tennessee, but yeah, they didn't have housing like three weeks before I was supposed to go away. And my dad was just like, no, you're not going away because we're not putting you in an apartment. You have to live on dorm. So I went to the school that my cousin was going to, Illinois State University. And I did want to study abroad, but fall of my junior year, but in the spring of my sophomore year, I ended up getting pregnant with my daughter. So I was not able to pursue that opportunity, but I just buried it deep down inside. And it was still a desire. It's always been a desire for me to study abroad. So I just did a little bit later. I asked Marie to tell me about her life after graduation. So I'm a speech pathologist by trade. And the first, I guess, experience I had with traveling for work or traveling via my profession was due to, I could be a travel therapist. So I got some contracts out in California was my first time going away for work and being like traveling with that. So I was put up in a apartment, a flat, and I just did work. And I thought, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. And then that was it. I did that for maybe about uh, three months. And then I returned back to the Atlanta, Georgia area and worked my regular job. And then the recession happened. And so that was like 2006. And I started losing contracts. I had contracts in the metro area. So I started losing contracts. They were starting just not to seek work outside of their agencies. 
So I just was getting a little bit bogged down. And then one day I just thought to myself, oh gosh, I wish I could just work on a beach. And then I would say one week later, I kid you not, I received a postcard in my uh, mailbox saying, wouldn't it be nice to work on a beach? And it was uh, for a contract in Hawaii. So I went to Hawaii, packed my house up and my daughter. And at the time she was just entering middle school or may have been one year into middle school. And we went to Hawaii and I lived and worked there. And that was where I got that bug of, oh, okay, yeah, I want to be far away and work, live and work in another, something totally different than what I'm used to within the continental U.S. So after Hawaii, the the world was in a, a, a big uproar, to be honest. It was now it's hardcore in the recession. So I returned back to Atlanta, but my contracts were just not, they were just hard to reacquire, I should say. So because I knew I had did some travel work in California, then I went to California. And this was like a pivotal point, I guess, in my life, my personal life, because I didn't want to have my daughter jump another school because she had just jumped with the Hawaii jump. So then we decided as parents for her to go to Chicago to live with her father and go to school while I do my contract in California, just because I knew it wasn't going to be long-term and she was in the pivotal point with her schooling. So we just decided that she would go to Chicago. Her dad's in education too. So she went to Chicago to go to school with her dad. And then maybe three months, maybe about six months, actually, I stayed out in California. Then I came back to Atlanta and then eventually moved to uh, Chicago within three months. Uh, I wanted to know what was the pivotal point in Marie's life that led her to embark in the journey to move abroad? So I'm originally from Chicago. Our family's from up there. So it's about five years into living and working in Chicago. My mom helped fell deeply ill. And yeah, so it was around that time that it was just so much changing, changes happening, taking place. My daughter was going into university. She may have been a freshman in university. My mom got really sick and I shifted my work and started like a little bit of an online practice and became a more of a full-time kind of caregiver for my mom. So, but still working to provide obviously, but it shifted with that. So, 2016 was when I moved abroad officially and my mom passed in September of 2016 and I moved abroad in October of 2016. So, it was just at a pivotal point in my life. My mom was no longer with me. My daughter was self-sufficient, a uh, rock star in college, just doing what she needs to do. Yeah, and I just I was just at a breaking point emotionally. So, I just I left I got a job, of course, but I left in for a a job in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. I asked Marie to tell me, how did she land her job in Dubai? Well, they actually selected me. I don't even know how they got my information, but they did on different professional message boards for speech therapy and then online therapy and then like traveling. During this time, I've always traveled, maybe taken maybe about three to five international trips a year. So it's I've always been in the... I guess, international sector that knowing that it's a world out there, I just didn't know how to break into it. So a company contacted me. It was a clinic in Dubai and I wanted to interview. I interviewed and then it just became an emotional roller coaster of, oh, they were offering me a job. You can move. So maybe they offered me the job in maybe July or August. And like I said, my mom was really ill, so I wasn't able to take the job. I was very honest and just saying it's not a good time in my life right now. And then after my mom passed, maybe they checked back in to see how, how are things going. And it was just like she passed. And I said, yeah, maybe I will be interested. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about it. Send me the contract, things like that. 
I read over the contract. It was a good contract on paper, but reality, when you're there, it was not a good contract, but it was good enough for me. And yeah, I needed a change. I had been to the region about 10 times. I had good friends that had lived there for about maybe eight years. So I knew the area and I just went for it. I was curious as to what was Marie's experience living in Dubai? Marie has shared that she had been a world traveler for a while before she moved abroad. And she'd actually been to Dubai several times before she decided to move there. And so I wanted to know, what was it like when she finally made the leap and lived in Dubai? And was it everything she expected it to be? Yeah, so I, I often refer to my Dubai time as Dubai debacle or Dubai disaster because I just really thought it was going to be a wonderful opportunity for me. I knew the area. It was a clinic based. I'm a I've done a lot of clinic based work, private uh, practice work. So I thought, yes, it would be perfect. And I get on site, and the clinic is beautiful. It's a beautiful location. But it's glitz and glam, which is Dubai in general. It's glitz and glam on the outside. But when you peel back the layers, it's different things. It's just different. I'll say that. But I get to the clinic and it was really, it was a really good setting. The clients were okay. They were very challenging. But what had happened was they had actually promised me to all these clients, to all the, the harder clients, typically children with autism, behavior disorders, nonverbal children. So it was just a hodgepodge of clients there, which they didn't really disclose of that, but I was okay with that because I'm a good therapist in regards to being able to handle a variety of types of disability. So I was okay with it. But they had promised me, so my waiting list was, they had promised me to their clients, like, oh, the American speech ther- American board speech therapist is coming. She has experience in X, Y, Z. So all these parents were basically waiting for me to get there. And just to flashback, remember, this was at a pivotal point in my time. I had just lost my mom a month earlier, packed up my flat and moved away across the world. So hindsight, I was not in a great space to, I could have moved across the world, but not in a great space to move across the world and take upon a position of this uh, magnitude. So I get there and I was just, I worked for a few weeks and I thought, okay, this is, I need to have a talk with the owner. They kept, you know, pushing me to the side. Oh, the owner's not in the country. She's be back. And with one thing when you move abroad, it's like this 30 days. If you don't have a work visa when you get there, which most places don't, they get you over there and then they swap your, your visa over to like a work type visa, but it's all done within the 30 days. And that's a pivotal kind of time period because after that 30 days, then they have invested in you a financial component. So really you're depending on the country, you could be legally bound to finish out your contract, or you could be in breach of contract type of thing. And you have to pay a lot of fines. So I knew this 30 day kind of timeline line was approaching. That's why I wanted to speak with the owner to try and revamp my contract a little bit. You had to see so many clients within a day and it was exhausting. I was very exhausted uh, mentally, physically. I just moved across the world, just lost my mom. And uh, I was just trying to rework the contract a little bit. And they kept pushing me off. The owner wasn't there because they were, they knew that timeline was coming and they knew, especially in Arab countries or in the Amensa region, the Middle East region, you, they really are big on kind of controlling their employees as far as with the contract, controlling with the contract or honoring their, their end of the contract, I should say. I don't want to make it seem like it's a villain, but they were working on their timeline. They kept pushing me off. A holiday was coming up, and after the holiday, then my timeline uh, would be over. It would be over the 30 days. So once they pressed me off, we were supposed to have a meeting with the boss and or the owner. And then once they once they pressed me off again, I just told them that respectfully that I don't think this is a, a good match for me. And I would like to be let out of the contract. You can just pay me for what it is. I won't take any other additional bonuses or anything like that. And we parted ways. So after a month, we parted ways. 
But my clients didn't want to part ways because in that month, their children, different clients had made such high gains that they were afraid that those gains would be lost. So I decided upon myself to take on the clients in a private manner. So I stayed in Dubai for about 10 months doing that. I was curious to understand how Marie created a business in Dubai. And I asked her if she could discuss the process of creating a free zone business. No, I did have my online clients in the States that I kept, but then I had private clients in house. And in Dubai, you can do like a free zone visa or establish your business in Dubai as in a free zone area. And yeah, so that was a whole nother disaster establishing that there just because it's very Arabic speaking or Arabic driven, which rightfully so it's in an Arabic country, but just trying to make sure you're not locking yourself into different types of bylaws, I guess, was just a headache and a half. So uh, some of the clients, my client was really close with one family. They helped me out a lot. I had, I saw her twin boys and they made great gains from nonverbal to verbal. And she was just really a catalyst. She got uh, me uh, more clients in. She was just really like my marketing um, person because she would tell all her friends and tell other friends. So that's how I got clients. Really, it was just for my work ethic and then word of mouth with this whole little parent network. And most of them were locals, but I had some expats too. But it was exhausting. It was it was very good money, of course, but it was exhausting. And maybe about six months in, I thought, oh, I have to figure out something else just because it was just daunting. I did it in home because I didn't have a, a site anymore, no clinic. So I did it in their homes. It was more like a mobile therapist. So it was just exhausting driving everywhere, going into people's homes and doing the therapy. So I knew a change needed to occur in Dubai. So I was offered a job at a hospital in Dubai while I was there. But there's another component with that. When you're in country and get a job versus out of country and getting a job, most employers would like to hire you as a local staff member because you're locally already in the country versus being hired as an expat, which is a totally different package. So I did all that with the, you had to get hired on with the hospital. And then the package they present was a local package. So I did have to decline on that. And then I just realized that this is not for me. I need to maybe move on from this region. And that's what brought me to the Philippines. So Marie decides to move to the Philippines And I asked her exactly what was the moment that made her decide to make that move? What was the process of her finding a job in the Philippines? And of course, what was it like when she landed there to live and work? So once again, this is me. I do my little go within. Once things aren't working, I am a a big, a person of tenacity. So I will do, I want turn away from something unless I give it my all. So I exhaust my, all my energy and then all my avenues before I say, okay, it's time to throw in the towel. So that's what happened with Dubai. It was just too many series of unfortunate events, I should say. And I thought to myself, I am big on meditation. So I did, it was around the time of Ramadan. So I was just really just going within a lot. And I just said, okay, what is it that I want? What is it that I need? What is it that I want? And I uh, went into my quiet place and I really was honest with myself. Oh, it would be nice. Once again, the same thing, kind of similar with Hawaii. If I could be in warm weather, do speech therapy, but get paid where where, where my money is not so uh, client driven. Whereas if clients cancel, they're going on holiday where I could have a steady income. And I remember these words very clearly. I remember this day. And I did that and I went about my day, went to go see my clients in the burning heat during Ramadan. And I want to say I had been putting out my fillers for other jobs too. I remember interviewing for a clinic in Cambodia and I thought it was nice, but it just wasn't for me. I, I would have just been going from another type of setting to that setting. So I passed on that. 
And then all of a sudden, actually, I had a um, girlfriend who's also a speech pathologist in Canada. She had messaged me on Facebook. Just you know, we had been, you know, chatting throughout my time in Dubai. And she said, um, oh, I'm in this one group. And I think someone said they were looking for a speech therapist in the Philippines because they're leaving due to their husband employer relocating them. And so then I wasn't really on social media at the time, but I uh, got on social media, got into this, got back into this little professional international speech pathologist group. And then I saw the, it was just a, a more of a message, not even like a advertisement. And I messaged the person uh, individually, just the right, it was a regular account. It wasn't a professional account. I messaged her and said I was interested. And she said, yeah, sure. Send your CV over. I'll send it to my department head. And that was how that happened. And I interviewed and the on the interview, they offered me the job. And then, yeah, I accepted it and was there. The first year was, it was good, I would say. I was... Happy to be back. I had visited the Philippines on my travel years before. So I was happy to be back in the Philippines, excited to be in Asia, Southeast Asia is one of my favorite regions to travel. So I was excited about the locale, the location. The first year, it was good. Actually, it, it, it wasn't too bad. Work was a little bit getting used to, primarily been my own boss. For a long, long time. So I went in as an employee, which has its pros and cons. It's consistent pay, consistent holidays, but it's also if things are not up to speed or up to code on running things as a private therapist. And so that took a little bit getting used to, but it wasn't nothing I couldn't overcome. I liked my colleagues. Yeah, it was, it was, it was good. I can't complain. Something that I discuss a lot mostly like on the IG lives and the YouTube lives is getting into like the cost of living of places. The Philippines is Southeast Asia. So it gets kind of broad brushed with the very, you know, inexpensive and cheap kind of living that's associated with parts of uh, Southeast Asia. So I had to ask Marie, did the Philippines live up to that reputation and what in fact was the cost of living in the philippines oh gosh that is the cost of living from the philippines to dubai it's okay so everyone thinks southeast asia the philippines is really cheap myself included i thought oh i am about to save everything because when I was in Dubai, everything that I earned, which was, I earned a, a, a very decent income, but it all went back out. It all went back out either to trying to establish the free zone for client stuff or rental cars or rental flats. So everything went out that was coming in for the most part. And then my bills, my daughter was still in university. So my bills to, <laughs> for her college was everything was just basically going out. Uh, allotted for. But in the Philippines, I thought, oh, it would be so cheap. But it wasn't. It's certain, certain things are cheap. Now you can get a mani pedi for, I don't know, $10, $15. You can get a massage for cheap. So services are cheap. However, cost of living is not comparable to Dubai. It will be mostly comparable, depending on the area, to a major city in um, the United States. So whether it's Chicago or maybe Atlanta, Florida, some certain parts of Florida, just depends on the region. But the, the area where I live in is very expensive. It's a primarily expat area. It's where my work is at. So expensive from the sense of you know, living in Southeast Asia, but not expensive in compared to just a regular normal life in a major U.S. city. So it's just average, I should say. Yeah, so in Dubai, I was renting as a borderline expat. My free zone visa had just had not come in. So I was still renting as if I was on holiday with no furniture, so a fully furnished flat. And I want to say it was maybe about $1,800 for a studio. Maybe sixteen, sixteen hundred dollars for a studio, and then in the Philippines, 
I want to say my rent is about $1,800, $1,600 to $1,800 again for where I'm at. But place in Dubai was a studio for $1,600 to $1,800. Place in Philippines is a one-bedroom for $1,600 to $1,800. I asked Marie how had the politics in the UAE and Philippines respectively influenced her experiences while living in each of the countries? Well, for the UAE, it's the politics is you need to uh, walk a straight line. Wherever you live, you have to abide by the laws of the land. You have to respect the laws of the land. You have to respect the culture of the laws of the land. So I think that's very important for people who wish to move abroad. I'm speaking from a westernized person of color uh, perspective. You have to respect that, a woman of color too, especially in the Middle East. So I have no problem with that. I've always had like international clients, even when I worked in the hospitals in the States. And I respect there. I'm actually intrigued by other cultures and things like that. So I think when you're in someone else's country, you're a, they're hosting you as an expat. You have to respect, regardless if you agree with it or not, you have to respect that. And I think that's that's why it doesn't bother me as much is because a i'm an expat so i'm coming from a different perspective but b it it's just what it is just like america has laws and and things we have to abide by you have to uh, oblige by that overseas so in the uae it was just that it was from a, a different perspective being a woman that you have to be respectful but it didn't bother me in the philippines it is more a little different they are westernized but they have a uh, a bit of the leader is operates in a more asian origin type of leadership so it's really he dictates the laws and then you oblige by the laws now the laws are fine now in the philippines now they are fine i know maybe as short as eight years ago there were it was a little bit different in the Philippines. But right now, you just obey the laws. I mean, they have a lot of them. You just obey them. But I, it hasn't really affected my political view. It's given me a little bit more introspective of how things operate on a political scheme outside of the states, because we're used to this facade of, I'm going to say a facade, facade of a democracy that we appear to have in the states. But we really don't have that in the States as much as we like to believe of that. But it just gave me a different um, perspective. But I don't agree with a lot of other political leaders, but it doesn't affect my day-to-day living. Hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And if you are please be sure to take a screenshot, tag Flourish Foreign, and share it across your social media networks. It's really important to share these stories. Since you are enjoying this episode, be sure to support this podcast by becoming a Patreon supporter at www.patreon.com slash Flourish Foreign, tipping the podcast via cash app at dollar sign Flourish Foreign, or purchasing an item off of the podcast Amazon wish list, which you can find at www.flourishintheforeign.com slash support. All right, on to the rest of the show. I was also really curious to learn more about the healthcare systems in both Dubai and the Philippines. And I asked Marie to give me her impression of these systems. Healthcare in Dubai was good. You can get whatever you need there and pay out of pocket too. Because at that point, I still didn't have like a healthcare system. So I was paying out of pocket for things in Dubai. I wasn't really a sickly person. So I didn't really go to, I think I went to the doctor once maybe. Oh, to get the physical for the free zone visa. But yeah, I didn't need to go to the doctor when I was in Dubai. Yeah, I just go to the pharmacist if I was feeling a little ill. You could just go walk into a pharmacist and 
basically ask for whatever. Tell the pharmacist some of the symptoms that you're having, and then they'll give you some supplements or give you some actual medication. So I did that on Dubai, but I really didn't get sick. There was more stress-related sickness. And then when that would happen, I would go within and just get myself aligned there. I did acupuncture in Dubai, I did massages. So those are all things readily available. I, I mostly focus on more Eastern way of treatment and not so much Western way. And then in Philippines, it's the same, very inexpensive. I would say more inexpensive than in Dubai. An average walk-in, just going to a doctor would be what would be considered like 30, maybe 28 US dollars paying out of pocket. But if you have insurance, then you don't pay anything. And this is for specialists. Like you can see any type of specialist or any type of regular doctor for that. Usually from 20 to $28, you can pay for that in the Philippines. So healthcare in the Philippines is actually, it's really good. But once again, I live in a highly expat area. So I, at my hospital is maybe four or five blocks, maybe, maybe about seven blocks away. And it's a private hospital. So it's a different perspective. I I want people to get a, a true understanding of when we're talking about all these different things, expensive uh, housing, and then the healthcare. Yeah, it is expensive, but coming from a westernized country, you have a certain level of standard. So yes, it it can be expensive. It doesn't necessarily uh, equate living abroad equates to being cheap or dirt cheap. It's cheaper, but it's not dirt cheap if you want to appeal, uphold your certain standard of living. So yeah, the healthcare is great. I had a health incident, not an incident, a health disaster, I should say, that occurred this past year where I was diagnosed and treated for reproductive cancer. That was, I'm so grateful to have been with an employer First of all, where my health insurance is was not even a factor of being worried. Whereas if I even would have been in the States to get treated chemo, I did six rounds of chemo, uh, countless rounds of red- radiation, that would have been an astronomical copay, even with our insurance in the States. So I was treated, diagnosed and treated in the Philippines. And although it was a long and hard, tumultuous journey, I am on the other side and my whole specialist team is very pleased with how everything's going and the results and how my tumors responded to to the treatment. So yeah, I have nothing but praises for the healthcare in the Philippines because healthcare is a financial burden, especially when you work for yourself over your whole, most of the majority of your career span and the quality of the health healthcare. So yeah, I have no complaints with them. I only paid out of pocket for my, I was on an extensive amount of medication. So I pay out of pocket for that, but I should have just turned in my receipts and I could have got that money back. But yeah, for any type of MRI, CAT scan, all that, all surgery, chemo, it, it was all covered. So I have nothing but praises for the Filipino healthcare system. I asked Marie to tell me about her experience being a Black woman abroad as a traveler and as an expat. I mean, being a Black woman in Dubai, it was fine. It wasn't any type of overt racism, maybe some cultural differences, of course, but the United Arab Emirates, UAE, is very, oh, how should I say this? It's a lot of expats that are coming from um, the United States, or they're even from all over, I should say, but there are people of color. So there are a lot of African Americans. There are a lot of people of African descent. They are There are uh, several people of Hispanic or Latino descent. So it's a lot of people of color there in the uh, UAE. And it's a lot of networks there. There are a lot of educator networks, clinicians, sorority, fraternities. So I, my lifestyle in Dubai, it was, I could go out and hang with people um, of similar interests if I wanted to. It wasn't my thing to do all the time, but it was absolutely there when I needed, I should say, a fix in Dubai. Now, in the Philippines, it was a little, very different. 
even though some Filipinos may consider themselves people of color, it's still very different. still a heavily Asian-dominated country. With There are several white, whether it's European, white South Africans, Australians, but not a lot of people of color in my area. Now, it may be a lot of Nigerian students in the university area. I know a lot of Nigerians, West Africans in general, may come over for schooling, but not so much in my area. It's only a few sprinkles of that, but it was never racism. I I personally, and I know people who have stated that they have acquired some racial incidents, but for me, it's more of a curiosity, I think, with the Filipino people and not necessarily uh, a racist action, overtly, as if in I was in the States or something. I had to ask, because y'all are nosy. That's what I'm saying. Y'all are nosy. I had to ask Marie, what has dating been like for her while she has been abroad? Well, dating in Dubai was good. We had some activities and suitors over there. That was good, but... I was a little stressed just with my lifestyle going on. So it wasn't really anything vested. Dating in the Philippines has been interesting. Two people that I've dated that I will say that I have dated. One was of African descent, Cameroonian, and then one was Indian. And both were different, but served their purpose as far as like company and someone to talk to, doing things together. But yeah, it just didn't work out. I just don't try to, you know, put that in my universe to say, oh, dating in such and such is hard or dating. It's the same thing as if you're stateside for uh, black women, it can be hard wherever you're at. But I really don't like to try and speak those words out because then it will be hard for me to to engage with someone of the opposite sex and have a uh, a relationship. All right. So, yeah, dating is it's different. But it doesn't have to be hard. You just have to open up your your options to others. But it's definitely different. I was curious to know what Marie's family thought of her jet-setting and expat-living ways. Were they supportive or were they less than? Well, I've always marched to my own beat. My nickname is Birdie in my family. So they just know Birdie can't be caged type of thing. My mom, I think she really started before, which I'm grateful for, before she passed away, she really came to terms with me being more of a a gypsy spirit or a nomadic spirit. And that was really, I'm really grateful for that, that she really came to terms. Because early on in my traveling career, when I was younger, my 20s and 30s, she just never understood why I have to go, go, go. Like why I couldn't just settle down and just be content with not traveling so much. It was to travel at that point. So yeah, my family, they just accept me for who who I am. Early on, even when I was younger, I've always marched to my own beat. I've always went left when all my siblings would go right. It was, it's just been a part of me. So I think they've had a years, decades of training knowing that I'm, I'm going to just be a free bird, just kind of be in the wind, but be grounded too. I'm a Capricorn, um, in spirit, Capricorn in nature. So I still have like a little bit of a structure personality, but I have a free spirit at heart. I truly do. And I'm grateful to acknowledge it and welcome it and not be ashamed of it. A lot of times people like to turn it into a negative thing that you are a free spirit or you're not with this kind of settled down approach. And I say, I'm happy that I am very um, confident in who I am. I know who I am and I'm unapologetic about that. So me being a free spirit should not make someone else uncomfortable if they are a highly structured person. That's just who you are and who I am is a is a, a, a free spirit nature. So yeah, my family accepts me for who I am. Marie is a longtime yogi and I asked her to tell me how did she get into yoga and how her practice 
has been influenced by her travels and her life abroad. My mother was a yogi. She, in the 70s and the 80s, I just remember her pushing out the furniture in the front room to make a big open space. And she would go through her asanas or her sequence, her flow. It wasn't a flow back then, but she was just doing her, doing her thing. And she would invite me to the mat or to the carpet to do things too. So that was my first introduction to yoga. And for 360, remember I said India was one of the adventures in my Choose Your Own Adventure books. So when I went to look it up in the encyclopedia, again, yoga came back around that way. So I think it's always been in my, in my shadow, but learning about it as an adult didn't come until maybe about I would say about a little bit before my 30th turning point in my years of living. And I was living in Atlanta at the time, and I just got heavily into Bikram yoga at the time. So I just practiced, was in the, we call it a coat because we would go five, six days a week. And so I knew of yoga that way, but Bikram was my first real introduction of a consistent practice. So I practiced Bikram. In Atlanta, then I found a studio in Chicago, was practicing Bikram there in Chicago. So everywhere I went, even when I traveled, I would find a yoga studio. It used to be my little thing. I would try and find a yoga studio and practice in that area, whether it's the continental U.S. or during my travels of away abroad, just for holidays, vacation. And then a couple of years ago, I, it, I've i always wanted to go for YTT, which is yoga tr- teacher training. but not so much in the essence at in this moment to just be a yoga teacher at a studio. It was more for me to go uh, deeper into my own practice. And yeah, so a couple of years ago, I found a yoga teacher program in the Philippines and I actually got certified to uh, teach Ashtanga yoga, which is like very scripted yoga, a little bit like Bikram, just take out the hot part of it. But it's a more scripted yoga. And I think that's what I like about it. It's a certain certain sequence of a uh, series of poses. But I've practiced flow, hatha, any type of yoga. I just, I, li- I like yoga. So any type of yoga I've practiced in studios, practiced in my home, practiced on grass. So yeah, that's how I got a little bit into the, the teacher training. And then it's been short-lived a little bit because... Right after that, I was diagnosed with the cancer, the reproductive cancer. So was not able to do much. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get back to my my mat is what we say. Started to get back to my mat to have a more consistent practice now that I'm stronger. I asked Marie to give some advice to all of you who may be on the fence about moving abroad. You cannot control every detail. I have known people who have really spreadsheet their life and kind of say, okay, I picked this country and I'm going to research everything and do all that. If that's your personality, that's fine. You can do that, but please don't set expectations. I've always had a saying my whole adult life, really, is expectations leads to disappointments. So when you put yourself into this expected box, oh, I expect this place, country will be like this, and my life abroad will be this way, then you're really setting yourself up for disappointments. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't set intentions. You can always be intentional in the way you move. But try not to have so many expectations just to go forward, to be present in the moment because you cannot control the future. You don't know what happens and anything can shift where it can change the trajectory of your abroad career or you moving abroad. So just you try not to have expectations, set your intentions, set your goals, but try to just take everything for what it is what it is, everything for what it is. You can set plans. I still planned while I've been abroad, but I've had to really acknowledge and reel in the expectations of of your life, of living abroad, being in another country, engaging with other people. And I think if you take it for what it is, 
regardless if it's the bad, you will still find the beauty in it. So Dubai has been that Dubai disaster, but if I didn't go through Dubai, then I wouldn't have necessarily been launched into the Philippines. Or I wouldn't have necessarily known really want to work for someone versus working for myself versus establishing a private clinic. I don't want all that. So I take Dubai for what it is. I I never would have met my clients and developed that relationship with my clients still to this day. And they were so appreciative of of my, my work there. And that's a good feeling to know that you really made a difference in someone's day-to-day lives. And I don't think I necessarily got that or, or saw that other side of it in the, the private practice realm, in the state, state side. So I would just say, go for it, set the intention and be ready. When you set that intention, the universe here is subconscious and conscious uh, uh, intention. So when you set that intention, things will start to fall into place and you would you won't even know how are they how they're happening. They just you will start meeting people, that connection meets with another connection and before it has uh, taken off. So be ready. You say you want to move abroad, you set the intention and then just let see where see where it takes you. I asked Marie to share some advice for those of you that want to go abroad but want to remain in your career field. I say absolutely stay in your field. It's a little bit of a pet peeve for me. I'm not a teacher, but I I come from a family of teachers and I have lots of friends who are teachers. And that that's a trained profession, but it it appears that a lot of people want that's the first thing they say is, "Oh, you want to go abroad, you need to teach." Now you can teach English, but that's that's a different realm than teaching at a, a qualified international school. So it's like telling someone, oh, you want to be a doctor? Oh, you should go overseas and be a doctor. You should go overseas and be a nurse, but you still need training. So I say whatever your profession is in the state, 90% of the time, you can find a similar profession or to do something in that field abroad. So you would have to, for me, it was once again, looking at my international organizations in my field, looking at my, we have boards. So we have to be a board certified speech pathologist. So I looked at my uh, national boards and they have an international sector or international forum. That way I just Googled sometimes clinics, a speech therapy clinic in whatever country I wanted and then sent my CV that way. So you have to be creative and aggressive and attentional if you would like to move abroad. So you have to do some let work. It will fall into your lap or kind of you can meet someone in that in your area that can meet someone. But you have to be intentional. You have to set the intention. You have to go looking for it. So I would say start with your professional organizations. If you're an accountant, if you are an engineer, um, a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, a therapist, a counselor, start with your professional um, organizations and then go from there and look abroad where there's a will, there's a way. Or if you even have a trade, you can start with that. If you have a hobby, you may can turn that hobby into an uh, international business that way. You don't necessarily have to be in your field. I've been in my field for 20 years. I want out of my field. I am, I am over being a speech uh, therapist. I'm very good at it, but I, I, it's time for me to do something else. So look into some things that you like to do and see if it's a need outside of your area. If you want to ever own a business, be a chef, whatever. So it's a, it's a time where you can reinvent yourself too, as far as your professional career is concerned. So you just have to see what you would like to have for your abroad life and then go from there. I asked Marie, what is her definition of wellness, of a life well lived and how living abroad has influenced that definition and that practice? Well, prior to moving abroad, I was traveling a lot, running races, so ran half marathons all over the U.S. and then all over the world, just for myself, is not competitively or anything like that. Is I enjoy running when I'm into it. I'm kind of out of it now, but when I'm into running, I used to enjoy it. it. Was my quiet place. It was about wellness. It was time for me. 
So I did run races, several races, half marathons all over. And then I ran the Chicago Marathon a few a few years back. So wellness would be like overall health. And it has to be tailored to your individual self. So I don't really want to say like prescribe like what is wellness because it has to be personalized. It has to be intuitive. And I think for myself, for my wellness or my wellness journey has always centered around whole health, whole body health, whole mental health, whole financial health. Like it's all that encompassed into one. You can't really have one area strong and not take care of those other areas. So wellness for me is making sure I have balance in those areas. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that all those areas are up to par at the same time. It's an active, intentional role that I do in order to try and get that, to get my wellness to be uh, holistic. So uh, that meditation is uh, very key for me. I'm not really, I grew up as a, a spiritual religious person, but that's not me as my adult life, I would say. So I'm very spiritual. I, I really like to take ownership of uh, my life, not really, I guess, leave it up into like this divine, I don't know, concept. So I I believe in the divine. I believe in a higher power. However, I do believe that you have to do your part. You have to set the intention. So as I stated in the, the interview, me setting the intentions when things are getting off whack, that's very important to me for me to acknowledge that things are getting out of whack or off kilter and then to go within to see, okay, what is it? What's making this off? Whether it's you start to have increased agitation or you're starting to eat crappy, usually it's an underlying meaning for that. So I try to acknowledge it, recognize it, acknowledge it, and then actively try to change it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's that it's the active part of it is what the wellness means to me, the intention, being aware. And that's wellness, being aware of your spending that promotes financial health, being aware of your eating that promotes nutritional health, being aware of if you're just sitting around the house all the time, sitting down, it promotes physical health because you want to get up. Oh, you say, oh, I've been sitting, I've been sitting on this couch all day. I need to move. I need to move my body, move my mind. I've been watching too much TV, being aware of that. So I need to read. So those are just things that I do for a wellness perspective. And it's overall, it's not one thing. It's a holistic approach. And it all goes back to my temple, my body. This is a gift from the divine above. So I need to take care of this gift while it's it's been lent to me, while I have this time on this earth in this realm of this earth. I asked Marie, where did she see herself in the foreseeable future? Oh, Christine, I wish I wish I knew. I know it's something with, there has to be something with holistic or wellness, just because this has been my, my personal life. And I've helped lots of friends and lots of colleagues and different things. So I know what it, it should be. The universe has set me up for this all my whole, all these years of personal research and personal exploration has to be for a reason up until this uh, this point. So I would like to do that. I would like to have incorporate some form of wellness and holistic treatments or approach or business into my next journey. I think I will probably be a speech therapist. Setting the intentions has come up a couple times now in my own personal uh, meditation of this number of five years. So within the next five years, I will be done with speech therapy. I've had a good run. I've had a, a great career, helped many people, all different races, ages, socioeconomic status. So I feel fulfilled in my life as speech therapy. I've worked abroad as a speech therapist. So yeah, I would like to do something else. What that may be, I don't know. I'm open to it. But yeah, I think it's time. I think I'm at a good point. You want to retire when you're on top. You don't want to retire when you're dragging to go to work or anything like that. So yeah, within the next five years, I would like to do something else. Just not quite sure 
what it is, what it will be, but I would like for it to be in a holistic wellness approach. Oh yeah, settling down in another place is definitely on my radar. It definitely will not be the Philippines. Um, it's way too far. My daughter, she's accepted me being a free bird. She does, she travels with me and she travels herself with her friends. So she she knows that's just her who her mom is, but she's just very concerned that it's so far. She wants me to be a little closer. So she says within one work day, being able to get to me. So I would like to maybe get into Central South America. I would like to concrete my Spanish tongue, if possible. If Europe could get their acts together, then possibly get into Spain. I would like to do Spain so I can get over to Africa a little bit easily to do for my travel, personal travel. So either or, it just depends. It's really in the development stages. The only thing I know right now for sure that's on my must list as it should, it should be a Spanish speaking country for sure. So that's all I have now. The Spanish speaking country and someplace I can afford. Thank you so much, Marie, for sharing your story and your wisdom. I really appreciate you. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to keep up with Marie, you can via social media. I'm not really on social media, but I am on social media. I just try to limit the the intake of that. But I do have an Instagram account. It's fly, F-L-Y, brown, B-R-O-W-N, yogi, Y-O-G-I. That's my Instagram handle. They can find me on there. Thanks again to Marie, and thank you all for listening to this episode. If you want to learn more about Marie, read her bio, look at her pictures, those kinds of things, you can check out her show notes page on the Flourish in the Foreign website. You can find it at www.flourishintheforeign.com slash episodes slash Marie. If you have been enjoying this episode, but also this podcast, I want to encourage you to support this Black woman podcast by becoming a Patreon today at www.flourishintheforeign.com slash Patreon by cash apping the podcast, dollar sign cash app, by purchasing me a coffee. You can buy me a coffee. Go ahead. Decaf is fine with almond milk. Thank you very much. (laughs) By sharing the podcast, by writing a review for the podcast, I appreciate all of those things. Thank you so, so much. Be sure to be following the podcast on social media at Flourish Foreign on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And definitely check out Flourish in the Foreign's YouTube channel. You'll find the latest video that I did with Itia Thomas, who is a past podcast guest living in Australia. She has an incredible program called The Career Upgrade. If you're looking to take your career abroad and you need some help, she is the lady to talk to. And so I interviewed her again, and this time we got really down and deep into exactly her strategy for landing her job in Australia and being able to negotiate residency in her compensation package. So if you want to learn more about her, if you're curious about the career upgrade, I suggest looking at that video, learning more about ITEA, and of course, booking your free discovery call with ITEA to see if you're a great match. I know that ITEA is just exceptional and she will get you where you need to go. But if you want to learn more about her, check out that video on the YouTube channel, check out her episode on the podcast, and check out more information about her on the resource page and in the show notes. All right. As always, thank you to Zachary Higgs for producing the music of this here podcast. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate you. If you need music for your podcast or your next creative endeavor, I highly suggest you hitting up Zachary. All of his information is in the show notes. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Remember, it's not about getting abroad or being abroad. It's about thriving abroad. So go abroad and cultivate a life well lived. See you next time. Bye.
on the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. One of the first things she said to me was, I don't even know why you're asking about relationships and work and money when you're so unhappy in New York. And that that was really shortly after I had moved there. I hadn't admitted to myself that I was so unhappy yet. So I was like, what? I'm it like I sh- I shouldn't stay here. I I should think outside of New York. And she said, not only should you think outside of New York, you should think outside of the country. Think about the whole world as an option for you. And obviously the conversation was much bigger than that, but that stuck with me to this day. Think about the whole world as an option for you. And I started thinking about the whole world.